I would like to say many thanks to our research committee. For those of you who don't know, we conduct our research uh, through a volunteer committee members as well as partners as needed for outside research support. And we had a particularly wonderful committee this year as we do every year. And I'd like to thank our co-leaders, uh, Chantal Cole from Toronto Crew and Julie Evinger from Crew Indy. Thank, many thanks to you. I'd also like to recognize and uh, appreciate Tiffany English, who is the Crew Network Global President this year. Her leadership has been really important to our uh, direction this year as we've continued to wade through a lot of uncertainty. So thank you, Tiffany. As we get started on this today, you know, a, cat you know, a catalyst for change, uh, COVID's impact on women in commercial real estate, I think is a really important topic for us to be talking about in this moment. You know, we've, we've been living through this pandemic now for nearly 20 months, and each of us has had different experiences, um, different positive moments, and some of those not so positive moments. But we know overall and throughout this, women have been impacted significantly in so many ways as, as the, the colleague, as the mother, as the teacher. In some cases, some of you had to do all three at once. And uh, I think this research paper will be fairly significant in that it enables us to separate out um, commercial real estate from all of the other global re research that has been done about the impact of COVID and the pandemic on women. So I'm, I'm delighted that we've got some data to share with you. I think it will be very helpful to companies going forward. And uh, we're going to find out both look at the global um, research that's been done and then give you that real estate perspective so we can dig into specific to us. I would like to acknowledge and comment that um, Crew Network is the leading, I'm very proud of the work we do on our research. We release an annual research paper typically at this time of year. We also benchmark the status of women in the industry every five years. And we are the only organization who actually conducts specific research on women and diversity in commercial real estate. And as you may know, in our 2020 benchmark study, we were we actually expanded our lens to include uh, women of color, women and men of color in that study. And we are the first, uh, we've created the first data to benchmark that. I'd like to pause for a moment and uh, show true appreciation to our program partner for industry research, Capital One. And with that, I would love to welcome Kristen Croxton, uh, Senior Vice President of Originations at Capital One Multifamily. Kristen, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks for having me join this webinar. It's an honor to be here representing Capital One and our partnership with Crew Network. The topic of this webinar is so important and we need to keep the focus on how to continue to support women in commercial real estate in the forefront of everyone's minds as we get ready to hopefully end this, leave this pandemic behind us. I was asked to share a few words on why Capital One supports Crew Network's research. The answer is pretty simple. Capital One and Crew share the same goal, to increase opportunities and advancement for women in the commercial real estate industry. At Capital One, diversity, inclusion, and belonging are valued at our core. Our goal is to empower our associates to do great work by creating an inclusive culture, one that values diverse perspectives, fosters collaboration, and encourages innovative ideas and creates a place where associates of all backgrounds can thrive by bringing their most authentic selves to work. We call this our culture of belonging and it rests at the heart of our diversity, inclusion and belonging efforts. We believe that Cruise Research provides an important tool in achieving our shared goal, particularly at this crucial moment when so many women are leaving or have left the workforce due to the impacts of COVID-19. In order to increase opportunities for women in commercial real estate, we must first better understand the barriers. The research is that CREW has provided has been instrumental in both highlighting those barriers as well as making concrete suggestions for removing them. Research papers can provide valuable eye-opening statistics and trends and information, but what, more, what was more important are the action steps that CREW will provide for us all to take back to our workplaces and the communities that we live in to continue to work on our goal. Like many of you, I find the statistics about women losing ground in the workplace during the pandemic to be frustrating and disheartening, although not at all surprising given the circumstances. When COVID shut down schools and daycare facilities, the majority of many, the majority of which was many women's support system, it became obvious that women would suffer more than their male counterparts. 
I know Wendy's going to share a lot of findings, but so I don't want to steal her thunder, but I would like to take a moment just to commend the, the number of women who bravely went out and started their own businesses during the chaos of COVID. They are the truly inspirational ones here. I also want to take a brief moment to just share what Capital One has take, done for its associates during the last 20 months. The focus on, on DIB was a sorry, focus on DIB was in place prior to COVID-19, but during the pandemic, these efforts became more amplified. When the pandemic began, Capital One immediately prioritized the health of its employees and customers during, sorry, during that time. In a matter of days, tens of thousands of employees were effectively set up to work from home, where the majority of us still remain today. In early 2020, as the schools and daycare closures became an overnight reality, we saw the opportunity to increase our time off programs to help take some of the stress away. Our HR and DIB teams also maintained a focus on pay equity throughout the organization during the pandemic to ensure that women did not lose ground against their male counterparts internally. We also added some resources that though they were not specifically set up for women were certainly the female workforce was the, uh, the greater benefit of. These included discounted childcare, additional backup childcare and family care through our partnership with Bright Horizons, discounted tutoring services for children who may need help with their schoolwork, parenting workshop series, including the back to school strategies, and an increased focus on mental health in general. Things like reminding associates it's okay to take lunch and to cross that or to block that time off your calendar. Also encouraging us to use our vacation time, even if that meant just spending a few days in our own backyards. In addition, they sent out care packages to associates throughout this time, which just included small snacks or other items, things to let us know that they were thinking of us. And these, these packages came from local small businesses. So it was kind of a win-win for everybody. And one last thing we created also was Focus Fridays. The idea was being was limiting internal meetings to allow associates time at the end of the week to get organized, catch up on work, and spend time working on their career development initiatives that can, sometimes can get lost in a busy day. After many associate surveys and what I'm sure are countless hours of analytical work, which we excel at here at Capital One, we announced our flex work schedule when we actually re will return to the office. The schedule will be Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in the office so we can collaborate with our team members and then go, keeping us at home Mondays and Fridays to allow us continued flexibility. Our customers and communities that we reside in have always been at the heart of what we do at Capital One. In that light, we have continued our partnerships with organizations across the country to, focus on, to continue our focus on DIB-related initiatives, programs like Fannie Mae's, multi, or Fannie Mae's Future Housing Leaders, Project Destined, and of course, Crew Network. Capital One's focus on women and other minorities can be felt throughout the organization, and its increased focus on support during COVID has allowed all of our associates to grow and to stay safe and healthy. Thank you for your time. I'll turn this back over to Wendy so we can get into the meat of the discussion now. Thank you. Kristen, thank you so much. Um, thank, many thanks to Capital One for their investment, not only in crew and the research that we're doing, but also the, the great things that they've done within their own company, showing that they truly do walk their talk. So thank you so much. Thank you. So let's get started. I wanted to do a quick overview. We'll be talking today, as I mentioned earlier, the overall effects of women in working in the workforce during the pandemic and how it affected them both on the global level as well as specific to commercial real estate and how both values and priorities have shifted and, you know, I think that we'll talk a lot about what we've been through and why that has been such a big factor. We'll talk about the factors that are affecting the companies as well as career success in this moment in time. And we'll talk about how companies can remain competitive and attractive as employers, which going forward, as you know, if you haven't looked around at the job market, there's a lot of jobs out there. And doesn't seem to be enough people to fill those jobs. So um, we'll also talk about uh, the new uh, cultures and policies that companies need to look at um, as they shape their workforce of the future. And we'll talk about strategies uh, for recruiting and advancing women. You know, this, this whole pandemic has really accelerated some, some aspects of our work. And, uh, and I think that... Uh, we'll see what we are each doing as well as some examples with our panelists. So let's take a look. This again, just as a reminder, is global research shows us that working women, especially uh, diverse women, were negatively affected by the pandemic. One in four women globally considered stepping out or stepping back from the workforce over the last 20 months. 
And if you look at these numbers, it's mind boggling, right? 800 billion in lost income for women, 64 million jobs lost. And of course the, the great um, lengthening of our ability, women's ability to have parity has been extended to 135 uh, years by 135 years. And when you look at, I thought this was a really interesting fact. When you look at the 8 billion in income lost, that is the combined G GDP of 98 countries. That's how much uh, women lost. So I think that, you know, we've all read multiple or articles about this impact on women and um, and these numbers really bring it, bring it home, right? And I think it's, it's just a really big, uh, important factor. And again, if we have that back in the economy, think how powerful that will be as well. Now, again, with the global research, you look at um, impact by country. We actually focused on uh, the countries where we have our greatest concentration of members. So you'll see that um, the pandemic erased three decades uh, worth of women's progress and gains in the United States alone. As of April, 2021, the US women's labor force participation rate was 57.2, which is the lowest level it's been since 1988, which is pretty incredible. Some of you probably weren't even born in 1988, right? I was, I'm just, just saying, but, but it, it's for me that I was adding up the numbers, it's hard to believe. In, in the UK, interestingly enough, the impact of COVID um, and the pandemic on men and women was actually quite equal. What was interesting was that the, um, the economic inactivity of women between the ages of 16 and 64 was at its lowest the preceding three months before February of 2021. And for men, it was their highest economic activity level. So that's saying to me that women were kind of holding on to their dollars and men were out there in the consumer world um, using, and so they had a record high. So when we look at Canada, the female labor force participation rate is at its lowest that it's been for, in 30 years. Nearly half a million Canadian women have left the workforce during the pandemic and have not returned to work. 200,000 of those women will remain uh, long-term out of the workforce. So I think you see there that the big global pieces, again, very big numbers that we're seeing in uh, that have impacted women, that have changed women. And here we'll just take a quick look globally, again, from the global research, the greater disparities for women of color. If you look at the unemployment rates, 9.1% for Latinx women, 8.4% for Black women, and 5.7% for white women. And so I think that millions we, I mean, this tells the story too, that millions of women worldwide have been dispor disproportionately impacted by job loss and loss of income. But, but I think from our perspective, we feel like there are bright spots and maybe you're seeing some of them as well because the pandemic has accelerated important changes in work culture, priorities and values. And I think that, you know, this has been a very reflective time for people, right? We're We've spent time and reevaluated. And I think what our data is showing us is how that's shifting how people feel. And that can be quite dramatic. And I'm not sure that, uh, and if people say this, we'll never go back to the way we were, we won't. Uh, but I think that this values priorities um, and what people are willing to do uh, in terms of their lifestyle and maintaining work-life balance, I think is going to be play a greater role than ever before. Uh, so as we go forward, let's look at COVID's impact on commercial real estate. So now we're going down to the real estate sector. So if you look at these numbers, 24% of the respondents said women in their work location left voluntary, voluntarily, 24% said that. So it may not have been them, but women at their work location. But if you look at the numbers, 12% um, of commercial real estate professionals left or lost their job. 78%, 78% were forced to leave either you know, through layoffs um, and then 22% left voluntarily. And those are the ones too that are, it's a real challenge. People just felt like they couldn't juggle it all and they needed to, to do something at, to remove themselves from that. So if you think about our, um, our study was done in July of 2021, which I'm gonna get to some of the details on that. Um, 
you know, as we, when we conducted this study at that time, though, you have to remember that the time period we were in, in May, June, July of last year, we really thought that we were at the beginning of the recovery, but that the pandemic was ending. And then all of a sudden, you know, Delta variant came away and stole our breath <laughs> and, uh, and put our masks back on our face. So, um, so the, the recovery has not, you know, we haven't seen that transpire. So these, the data here is um, important. And as you look at those who left or lost their jobs, 97% were women. And then you can see the impact disproportionate for women who are Latinx or black. And I think that's important as well. Um, so let's take a quick look at the methodology just so you have a great context for this. Over 1,000 respondents uh, responded to our survey, we, which represents 25 specializations and 10 sectors in commercial real estate. 95% identified as women, 82% identified as white, and 18% identified as mixed race or non-white. So, you know, when you look at this data as we go through, you'll see that the, the um, as you look at the responses, you'll see a lot of this was from women um, who were white, and we do have some breakouts on diversity as well. So the next data piece that I want to share with you is on the effect of the pandemic on compensation. And I think more than half of the commercial real estate professionals who responded to the survey said that they missed out on deals, so 54%. Um, however, the vast majority, 76% said that their compensation increased or stayed the same. And I, I think in 2020, I think that's, I mean, that's substantial. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I've been doing this thing where whenever I get on the call and I'll call with people, I always ask, how are things going in your market? How are they going in your sector? And nine times out of 10, maybe even nine and a half, members are saying, I'm busy. I'm so busy. Business is busy. And you know, in probably maybe May or June of 2020, we thought this is it, the world's ending. You know, what's in the pipeline is gonna finish. We're not gonna have more um, to, to do after that. And what really essentially happened was once we realized that the pandemic was sticking around, people just said, okay, let's move on. Let's figure out how we can do business while being in the pandemic. So I, it's not surprising to me in some ways that 76% said that they uh, their compensation increased or stayed. Um, but again, if you look at the data, um, again, Latinx and Black women uh, were less likely to have received increases in their compensation uh, in the last year, in 2020. Looking ahead, one piece of data that doesn't show up on, on here, but I think is important, is that 87% 87 of respondents reported that they believe that in 2021, they will receive an increase or stay the same. And I think as we look at that, we can intuit from that that perhaps there's this optimism now, you know, that signals some optimism. Though I will say, I just read an article, a, a Globe Street article that said that CREs do for a correction. So don't bank on my, uh, my data here. You never know. Um, so there's the compensation piece that um, impact. And then in terms of career satisfaction in commercial real estate, 53% said their career satisfaction increased, which I have to believe has to do something with being able to work at home and have some flexibility. Um, and, and you can see the breakdown between men and women. And then 40, 47% said their career satisfaction decreased. Now, if we look back on who networks benchmark study, which was actually conducted before the pandemic in early 2020 and released in late 2020, at that time when we did the research and we asked about career satisfaction, uh, it was, at the lowest level for women that it had been since 2005, which was 55%. Um, so 55% said they were very satisfied. Uh, the pandemic has further affected this both in positive and negative ways. Um, so for this July study, you see here that um, in just one year, 53%, uh, 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 the, the satisfaction rate went from 55% down to 53%. So it wasn't that terrible. So. I just keep extrapolating from that. What is it that the 53% um, is driving that? And I do believe that there are some, a uh, lot of things like similar to what Kristen said that the companies are doing for their employees. And I think you'll hear more of that as we go on from our other panelists. Um, but I also think that sometimes it's that simply just having more flexibility that makes the difference. 
When we look at what the respondent said on progress for gender parity, um, and we're gonna do a little chat storm here, uh, which Laura doesn't know about, but I'm in charge of the slides so I can do this. And uh, what I'd like for you to do is, so again, looking at this, that the respondent said 38% said that the pandemic has stalled progress for women. 32% said pandemic derailed progress. 16% had said it had little or no impact. 14% said it leveled the play, playing field for women, which I think is really interesting. And I wonder, again, if that also has something to do with being remote, that everybody was out of sight and out of mind. Um, and maybe I'm wrong on that, but I just, it's, it's interesting that level the field uh, piece of data there. Uh, so what I'd love for you guys to do, um, if you would, is to put one word in the chat storm of what you think the progress on gender parity has. Has it stalled? Has it derailed? Has it had no impact or leveled? Throw your word in the chat storm and let's see what we come up with. What is your word? What has been your experience? And, and we'll see. I wish I had a poll and I could see if the numbers were exactly alike, but this is off the cuff. It's just something I do to throw in there. So, um, and, and I'd love to hear if you feel like there's something you know about why you feel like um, the pandemic has leveled the playing field, throw that in there too. I'd love to hear perspectives on that. So let's go on while you're doing that. And then um, I'm looking at answers here, stalled, unsure, stalled, derailed, you know, stalled, a lot of stalled, people feel like that. And that again was the highest percentage. And uh, Lisa had said it, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. So. So there's a good mix of, um, of answers there. So thank you for participating in that. Now I'd like to get to, let me see how we're doing on time. I'd like to get to the shift in priorities. 50% 50, 50 said their career priorities have changed. 74% said their personal priorities have changed. And of the 74%, 90% were women. You know, think about that. Nine out of 10 women said that their personal priorities have changed. And, you know, in the survey comments, which we do have anecdotal comments from the survey participants, we kind of molded them down. And there were three key areas that they said matter more to them than ever before. And the first one is work-life balance, go figure. We all know that. Whether you have children or not, being burned out is no fun. And I think that people feel that and have felt that in this environment only because in the very beginning, there was so much uncertainty in that transition to being 100% remote, being 100% off the road for many of us who travel significant, um, being home with that spouse that perhaps, not talking about myself, just saying, but perhaps you don't spend that much time with them, which I don't, but um, it's different, right? It changed everything for you. So I think it's that work-life balance. The, the second one was self-care and mental health. And I've seen this personally in many of my friends that have had a lot of anxiety, anxiousness, um, uh, and uh, you know, even depression for those who, who are stuck in one place that aren't used to doing that. So I think that self-care and mental health has really come to the forefront, uh, both in our industry and uh, around the world. And then finally, the third thing, again, no surprise, you'll hear me say this throughout this, is the flexible work arrangements. Those were the three things that um, you know, their priorities have shifted. And I think that's important for us to both acknowledge and for employers to understand. And uh, it really is going to change the way we are in the future. Um, in, in fact, you know, it's fun, it, one of the anecdotal comments that we got um, frequently was that respondents said that they're willing to leave companies if they don't have flexible work arrangements. So I think as we all come back and we're thinking about how we come back, employers really need to give consideration to that. And I think Capital One has given an example, and we'll, we'll talk to some other companies and get those examples. And one of the other things I want to mention on this slide is about in our benchmark study in 2020, we asked about career um, barriers to advancement in careers. And uh, the top three in 2020 were lack of promotion opportunity, gender discrimination, and lack of a mentor or sponsor. In the July 2021, survey to support this research paper, we asked that same question with the same responses. And number one for this, um, for, for this um, 2020 study was choosing work-life balance. 
as you know a priority for you. And and if you choose that, then that becomes a um, a barrier. Uh, lack of promotion opportunity was second, and limited access to decision makers was number three. But that does go back to that whole thing of think about in in one year, what was number four on the list in 2020 became number one, and that is the work life balance. And that's why I keep saying that's that's a game changer. Um, and so companies really need to be thinking about that and thinking what that means and how do we get women, we call it winning women back. We should be very much in demand going forward. So we asked respondents about their preferred work arrangements. You see employees said 68%, the flexible work, 17% will actively seek to work for a company that has flexibility. On the company side, 70% of respondents said their companies have already created new policies. 50% believe that their companies will offer increased flexibility post pandemic. And so I think we already see companies responding to that, which is good. Um, as we look at um, uh, additional aspects of this, we really, I mean, think about uh, high, highlighting these strategies and tactics that companies are taking to support, which is investing in uh, family care, in the family care sector and supporting employees with that, um, enabling uh, access to caregiving leave for both men and women, combating burnout. How many of you feel burnout right now? You don't have to tell me, you don't have to admit it, but, but I mean, I'm tired. This has been a long road. And if, if you folks are not tired, I wanna know what you have that I don't have because this is hard work being being in the role we're in, it, and it hasn't been um, an easy path forward. And I'll tell you, you know, I think women in the workforce are, many of us are here by choice because we love to work and we're type A and we want to do things. But at the end of the day, you know, this 20 months has been, it's taken a real toll. And, and so I, I can appreciate that burnout. Um, and so companies are offering people paid time off. And I guess my thought is, if we take time off, how far do we get behind? And that's our mindset, right? I can't possibly take more time off to deal with my burnout because then if I do, I'll come back and I'll be even more burned out. But don't go there because that's just a, a circular experience that you'll never get out of. Take the time off. Um, and then the other piece that companies are doing is prioritizing DEI, which is something that I believe was started by many companies in commercial real estate prior to the pandemic and prior to um, the social unrest and and it just has accelerated so much since then. And that again is one of those positive bright spots we see in all of that that's been happening. At this point, I'd like to pause and introduce two of our panelists. I'm, I'm going to start with um, Lindsay uh, Fiaro. Uh, Lindsay is the Senior Vice President of Operations at NAR Global. And I'd like to ask Lindsay, if you could talk a little bit about what NAI has been doing. I mean, tell me your thoughts about some of this data and, and your, the research that we're seeing, as well as some of the things that your company is doing around employee engagement and um, creating a culture. Absolutely. And uh, first, I want to thank you, Wendy, for having me here. It's, it's conversations like this that push me to thrive and succeed in commercial real estate. Um, you know, my, my initial thoughts were both shocked and surprised all at the same time by some of the data. And what I mean by that is women making up 64 million of job losses in 2020 is outrageous. Um, women in general hold such a variety of roles in so many industries, and we are the powerhouses behind so many organizations running from the ground up and the top down. And a lot of these job losses severely impacted these organizations more than they could have planned for. And it's very, very clear that several industries, not just commercial real estate, have a lot of work to do as women, um, you know, and together to drive that change. So, you know, I was very shocked. And, and to kind of go back to what you were saying, Wendy, about the barriers to success, that was something that caught my eye. Um, the fact that the first barrier named was maintaining work-life balance. Here's why it caught me by surprise. At NAI, that is something we're actually using as a recruiting tool to recruit women back to NAI or to, or, excuse me, or to NAI in general. And this is something at the corporate level as well as the membership level. Um, you know, as we discussed, there are so many um, females during this crisis that have felt burned out and exhausted and under pressure. But several of these women could be excellent candidates for professional jobs in our industry. 
and it's more specifically for women that have that customer engagement experience. So we're actually using that as a recruiting tool because we feel that this industry can actually be more beneficial to them than in other industries that they might be in. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting that I would love to share with you is that in speaking with uh, male colleagues of mine, as well as family and friends that I have in either commercial or in the residential uh, re uh, real estate industry is that those men that are in that industry were actually had a more flexible job than their wives in other industry. And so those men actually took on that primary caretaker position that women are usually used to. And so in those conversations that I've had with these men, they acknowledged, wow, you know, this was kind of that glass breaking method. Um, and wow, like we didn't realize what women actually went through. We didn't realize what our wives went through, what moms went through. This is a lot and we appreciate, we appreciate them so much more now that we understand the pressure that they were under. I think that this is so important because it shows that men and other situations as well, we do not understand what other people are going through until we've walked in their shoes. And so this crisis that we've all have gone through, you know, it really has opened up a lot of doors um, to awareness. And I think that's extremely important. Um, to dive into what NAI um, has done to support women during COVID-19, I'll, I'll speak first to a personal experience of mine corporately. In 2020, I was pregnant um, and it was very, very stressful. And I'm the second time mom in 2020. So I can only imagine what those first time moms have been thinking and going through um, last year. And so as we were talking about going back to the office, um, you know, we were surveying employees and I had specifically said, you know, um, I have a demanding job and I am very pregnant and I'm uncomfortable going back into Manhattan during this time. Um, you know, there was, uh, I, I'm based out of New York, as you know, as I just mentioned, and there was a lot that was happening in the city during 2020 and I felt uncomfortable. And luckily my boss um, and the rest of leadership without hesitation just said, you have to do what you think is best for the health and safety of yourself and your soon to be newborn baby. So I was extremely pleased and overwhelmed that um, I had their support. And the reason is because I have friends in other industries that didn't get that support from their, from their leaders. They were forced to go into the city, to take the subway, to take cabs, whatever they had to do. And they, had, they were forced to go in and unfortunately work as uncomfortable as may have been and put themselves and their baby at risk. So I was appreciative for that. Um, on the membership level, all of our firms are independently owned and operated. And so we created a women's alliance many, many years ago, but actually prior to um, the pandemic, we actually relaunched that initiative and we hired a consultant to curate several workshops that were supposed to be in person that ended up because of the pandemic ended up being virtual. It was the best idea we've ever done. Um, you know, we touched on, um, you know, uh, feedback. We touched on, you know, that work, uh, work, um, work and at home balance. And it became a forum for us to relieve anxiety and to deepen roots, um, our relationships with one another as women in NAI. Um, so this was a very good thing to do. And we're very pleased and through that, Alliance and through hiring the consultant, we were able to offer to the Women's Alliance members, hey, you know, it's very hard to have career advancements during this time, but we will help pay for one monthly one-on-one -on -one coaching with this consultant. So we were very happy to, to push that out there. Um, you know, um, sponsoring the Women's Alliance and, you know, um, creating a diversity, equity, inclusion council is something that we're very proud of. And you know, we it's our goal to continuously recruit um, members that have deep optimism and creating change. So we're very pleased with that. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Great sure. stories. And I, I, I love your comment about one of the bright spots in the pandemic is certainly that it has created 
a, a really great new awareness about so many things that, that our spouses or partners or our employers maybe never considered before. So thanks for sharing that and your own personal story. I just wanted to um, go back for a moment and just say there was some great chat on there about burnout. And I just want you to know you're absolutely right. You are in good company. And um, I love the idea of whatever you're saving in commute time, you give half to yourself. Uh, to avoid burnout and have to your company. That's, uh, I think that's generous. And I like that idea. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. And, and you know, just know, I appreciate your comments and your honesty and, and being willing to share. On that note, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Lisa Kanishka from uh, CBRE. She's executive vice president at CBRE, um, who is one of our longtime partners along with NAI Global. I should have mentioned that there. And CBRE is a premier lead partner. Lisa actually was probably the pioneer in organizing <laughs> women's networks back in the day, because I know you've been leading one at CBRE for 20 or 25 years, right? So I'll it's take 21 away. years. Yeah. Many? Yes. 21 years. Oh, yeah. See. Yeah. Well, Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your thoughts sure. on the research as well as some of the things CBRE is doing that have been impactful? Absolutely. Well, you know, I think, you know, the research is fabulous because it, it, it certainly, you know, reinforces everything that we were thinking about in, intuitively, but it, it brings a level of awareness up to the di disproportionate impact on, on women and that there needs to be an awareness about that, not only amongst women and saying, oh my gosh, this is impacting me in a different way and I need to act, react differently towards it, but also um, to take and look at leadership, make sure that leadership is looking at that as well and realizing that, you know, one size does not fit all. I really liked what Lindsay said about the fact that we're seeing across all genders an awareness that, that the responsibilities that fall on different members of families and different, and, and women particularly in different roles, that that awareness was heightened a little bit during this time because everybody had to work from home and, and deal with having a lot of different coworkers than they're used to having, that's for sure. But I think that the, what this research really says is that it's really, it's critical and crucial that we understand what the needs are of our current female employee, current female population that's in the commercial real estate world, and really what we're going to do to make sure that those women stay engaged in commercial real estate, as well as figuring out how to sort of make sure that our industry pivots to attract more talent. Because you know, forget, you know, there's all these pandemic issues that go along with this, but also there's just a, a, a deficit of women that are involved in our industry to begin with. And so we really have to have to, as an industry, engage in thinking about how we can become attractive to a much more diverse population. And that's going to be in a different way than we may have thought about it two years ago. And so I think that this research really helps to support the idea that there are a lot of pivots that are required. And, you know, when I think about really what we did at CB, so as you mentioned, Wendy, we've had a women's initiative, the CBRE Women's Network, that's been around for 21 years. In fact, it was kind of tough because we had to celebrate our 20th anniversary virtually, which was really a bummer because we had a big plan for something in person, but uh, we made the best of it. And, uh, you know, we saw like an even more intense engagement in our, our network because women needed support. I remember one woman saying to me, she's like, I have been running a marathon for the last two months that has never ended. She's like, I get up before the kids, I work, I take care of the kids all day, I work, I worry about whether my manager is worried about the fact that I'm not on, the, on camera on Zoom because I've got a two-year-old that's screaming and I've got you know, the puppy that's doing this because everybody got you know, COVID puppies and all the other things that were going on. And, and we're really, really worried about you know, if they weren't on camera, which they couldn't be because there were so many things pulling at them, were they actually gonna be getting the credit that was due for the work that they were doing? And so they were working until two, three in the morning and then getting up and doing it all over again. And so what we looked at within our women's network is we said, how can we support our women as quickly as possible? So one of the neat things is, is we have this field delegate program, which are our geographic communities that are spread out across all of our different offices. And then we have this amazing virtual chapter we have over 500 women that are working virtually that aren't based in a physical CBRE office and they have their own chapter and network. And so they really sort of um, stepped up and said, hey, you know what, we're gonna take all the stuff that's working for us virtually because that's the way we live all the time and we're gonna give it to all of you to help support you. So they really were an incredible foundation 
And, but what we really did is we really focused on creating individual conversations for all of our women based on what they were worried about. And so we had all of these different conversations around whether it was dealing with, you know, homeschooling, you know, you know, great, great school kids, preschool kids, teenagers, it was kind of the whole spectrum worried about how you manage your presence when you're not in the office and with your manager, things like that. So we spent a lot of time creating all of these group, small group conversations through Zoom that everybody could have. We had lots of that, lots of engagement. And when I say lots, I mean over a thousand people, right? So women were really clamoring for support. We also were able to sort of pivot that same level of conversation um, certainly around um, uh, with our DEI partners and partnering with our African American network, networking group around the things that were going on around racial equality and and all of those concerns. So I think we felt like we what we did first was we said let's just hunker in, make sure everybody's taken care of, and then we've subsequently been look, looking at focusing really around sort of creating support and opportunity um, for our women because things are different than they were before. So a couple of things that we've done or we've created a business line cohort program where we now connect our women based on the, on the business lines that they're working on. It's a new program. We launched it. We had over a thousand women engage, or I'm sorry, over 2000 women engage out of the box. So I think women are really looking for connection. And so we found that really when we put that programming out there, they engage. We also really focused on our working parents because working parents are really just in a different role than they've ever been before. And, and continued hybrid work will make that a little bit more challenging. So we actually have a working parents collective that um, not only is providing support to all of our working parents, um, it's driven primarily around our women, but certainly anybody who's a parent is allowed to be engaged in it. Uh, but um, it's also something that we partner with our HR team to make sure that we're giving our women the support that they need. Literally started as a grassroots effort where it was literally just this like list that kept being added to of all the online resources, you know, virtual tour of this zoo, virtual tour of this museum, anything that you could possibly do just to kind of give somebody a little help to maybe keep their kids busy for a few moments so that they could catch their breath and take care of their career. And I'd say the final thing that really we've spent a lot of time doing is really helping our women to think about what going forward, right? We, we want to retain our women, but it was interesting. We talked a little bit about how many women have started new new companies during this time period. There's been a lot of, I mean, every one of us admittedly on this call, probably we've all stepped back and said, am I doing what I really love doing, right? You had a few moments to say, is this what I really wanna do? And a lot of women pivoted, right? They decided to start their own, their own companies. They maybe switch careers. They may have stepped back and said, you know what? My family is my priority. And so what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that those women are gonna stay engaged and engaged at CBRE. So we, um, have kind of put together a bunch of programs where we did a, we put out over 2000 strengths finder assessments where women could really focus on what their strengths were um, and then use those tools to start, um, make sure that they know kind of where they can move forward in their career. And probably one of the more important things that we did most recently was to have a program about adapting your career journey in a more flexible hybrid world. Because if you think about what your career strategies are to sort of advance and move forward, a lot of those are, are sometimes built on sort of those incidental conversations. You run into your manager, you have a conversation, you run into someone, you have a bit of a talk about, about what's going on in business. And I think those things are a little bit more challenging to do when you're working in a hybrid world. So we really want to start making that part of your career development much more intentional. So uh, we really are trying to focus on making sure that all those pieces are, are there and that foundation is there so our women are supported. I will say that probably one of the best things that happened for me, because it's been a huge goal since I started this women's network uh, 21 years ago, is I always had this goal that we wanted 5,000 members. And we were always like 4,000 something, 2,000, you know, it's like slowly, and believe it or not, during the pandemic, more women engaged and we finally hit our 5,000 mark. So really proud of what uh, all of our women have done and they've been a highly engaged group. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I, I just can't, um... That point, I think about engagement, we felt that at Crew too. Our members needed us more than ever when the pandemic, it, the first month, I think people were like, okay, what's going on? What's going on? But as time went on, you felt that intense need for engagement and connection. And so I, it's no wonder that five thighs, you got to your 5,000 number. Not that you wouldn't have, because it's a great uh, effort that you put in, but, but it is true. I think that, um, and I wonder, I mean, this is just me off the top of my head going, I wonder 
women felt this great need to stay connected and to feel supported and encouraged each other. I wonder how men deal with that. <laughs> you know, I mean, do they feel that same need? Do they feel, so I, I don't know. And is that a, a kind of a, a thing that will impact the workforce as well as men's experience in this different from women's, um, which is not our issue or topic here today, but I do, I think women have that, just that need to connect and feel connected. And so I think it's been really great to hear um, both you and Lindsay share some of those, you know, the coaching piece uh, that Lindsay, I, I can't tell you, so I don't know, some of you may know this, but I'm a certified executive leadership coach. And for me, uh, you know, coaching is the most powerful experience you can have um, to grow yourself. And so I highly recommend it. Um, I'm not coaching, so I'm not, this isn't a pitch, but it is. And so it's great to hear that your company was providing that, Lindsay, that's huge. And take advantage. If your company ever provides that, put your hand up do it. It's the best thing for your, for you and for your career. Um, and I also like Lisa, you mentioned assessments and I think that can be a real inspiration and help grow understanding and just creates awareness, um, among your women leaders. And, and then additionally, Lisa, I think you said the resources just grew and grew and grew. And it's just such a testament to women and supporting one another that you were talking about the 500 group that said, well, wait a minute, we, we've been doing this forever. We can help you. So it's really great to hear those stories. And, and also, I would just like to add, going back to Kristen's comments, I really, really want to steal uh, Focus Fridays. I want to do that at Crew because I find myself by the end of the week, like I'm just, I can't take another Zoom call. I just can't do it. And I would love to have a day where all I did was actually catch up on things. So um, thanks for all those great ideas. I'm going to steal some. Um, but let's go on now. And we have about 15 minutes left. So what I'd like to suggest to the group is, uh, for those of you here with us, is to just go ahead. If you have a question for one of the panelists, if you'd like to, them to elaborate on something or ask a question, I'd love to have you um, post that in the chat. I will try to keep up on that. I'm going to finish out these slides. Um, and then we'll take questions if we have. And I have a little bit of a wrap up. So we always close our research reports with action items for companies and individuals, uh, women, HR. So here for company leaders, I think it's really important um, that we look at what we need to do because this is a moment in time and it is not gonna change. This is a critical moment for employers to really take those next steps, which it sounds like many of, many of them are. So, um, you know, that we need to create and maintain this inclusive high trust culture that support women along with the flexibility of not being together most days of the week possibly. Demonstrate a visible and measurable leadership commitment to gender equality. You know, this is one of the big things that we, you know, we talk about a lot at Crew is it's one thing to say I commit to, you know, that we want to have more gender diversity and whatnot, but seeing the action, making sure that it's visible and measurable is really, really important. And so I would encourage uh, you to take that back to company. Normalize flexible working. It's not a benefit. It's not a value. It's, it's not, it, it is normalized now. We have been successful for two years. Acknowledge that women of color face a different set of barriers than white women. We have to be honest about this. We have to put that on the table and we have to be intentional about doing things that will address this issue. So please take that to your companies. And, you know, a couple of things that I want to say is that leadership has to be willing to adapt and change to keep talent. And it's never been more apparent than right now. And also em employers are now, you're now looking at and facing the workforce of the future. These issues that we're talking about and these barriers and these um, needs of uh, members of your team and the talent they're not gonna go away. So I think it's really important to keep that in the forefront. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna finish up the, um, these three action items and then we'll go to some questions. So continue to focus on recruiting women, women of color and retaining them. We, you know, in this industry have, have tended to bring people in that I, are diverse, women of color and uh, women in general and just, throw them into the melu and say, okay, sink or swim. That's just no way to retain talent. That's why we lose talent. So that retention piece, and that's the exclusive, excuse me, the exclusive or inclusivity piece, and it's the belonging. Um, that goes to, to that for sure. Conduct pay equity studies regularly. 
don't just do it one and done. This is an ongoing evolutionary thing. We will never um, have parity with men if we aren't constantly being on top of that and doing these pay equity studies. Um, you know, I would say also that um, partnering with Crew Network, which this is a shameless plug that for those of you who are members of Crew, you know, you know that your life would have been much different without Crew the last 20 months. And we have been very, very intentional about making sure that we're bringing out the things that will matter to you that you need, um, the connections, as well as the, the information we spent time on last year. Crew has never been more important to both you as an individual. It's a great investment in you for your company. And I think it's that that um, belonging and the, the, you know, the open forum and the connections we created online were really life-saving, I think, to so many of us during this, this really difficult 20 months. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pause and say um, to the panelists, I have a couple questions here. I'm gonna go back up. This is a question, question for the panelists. How are you supporting the spirit of culture in a hybrid environment where women may still be remote versus others in the office? And I'll start with Lindsay on this. How is your company creating a, a spirit or culture, um, a spirit of culture in the hybrid environment? It was very important for us to make sure that um, all of our employees, especially the women, um, still felt um, a part of the work community, our workforce, um, and still made sure that their mental health was in check. Um, and so a couple of things we did were um, Girls' Day, <laughs> where we had just, um, you know, a girls' happy hour just amongst our employees, our female employees, which was a lot of fun. Um, if we did notice that there was, um, you know, maybe somebody who just did not seem right or so, um, of course, like I did the reaching out to make sure that it was a fe another female talking to them to see, hey, what's going on? We wanted to make sure that, you know, we're kind of a small group. And so um, we're very personable with one another. So I wanted to make sure that they knew that specifically myself and our CFO, who's also female, that they knew that we were still there for them. Um, for the women that continued to choose to work remotely, um, if we felt like there was, they were struggling between balancing the children, work, cooking dinner, um, we actually sent them dinner several times for the entire week, um, which they were very much appreciative to. Um, but just to keep up the, the happy culture and team environment in general, um, we had a happy hour for the entire team every Thursday um, uh, during 2020, uh, where we also did trivia, um, where everybody was able to organize one thing of trivia um, every other week. So those are just a couple of things we did. And um, you know we're always there to help support them. Uh, Lisa, do you want to add to that? And Kristen, I'll, if you want to think about it, if there's anything you'd like to add as well, but Lisa, go ahead. Sure. So our, you know what, um, I'll just talk maybe from the women's networks perspective, because there's a lot more that I could talk about from the company perspective. But I think I mentioned that we have these have field delegates, which are women who lead local geographic communities in each of our offices, and they are just phenomenal. They are the lifeblood of our women's network, and they really stepped up during the pandemic. So while those women normally would have been programming anywhere from four to gosh, 12 or even more than you know, more than monthly um, type of events for their local communities um, in person prior to the pandemic, they really all pivoted in a way that was just fabulous to, um, you know, Lindsay's kind of given some of the ideas, whether it was, you know, virtual sort of trivia games, happy hours, but really all about just connection and making sure that everybody was okay and that you saw each other. Um, and so feel like our field delicate community really, really stepped up and took care of a lot of those pieces. I'd say the other part was really more of those um, from a company perspective, so it was really those more broad reaching sort of communications that would come out. And, you know, while every one of us probably hates a certain element of Zoom, and I'm always looking at my hair going, oh my God, I look terrible. <laughs> I, where are those wrinkles? Where did they come from? I didn't put my makeup on right today. My glasses are, are tilted, whatever it is. I think that there's the other side of it is, is that you have this great opportunity to connect with people that you don't normally connect with, right? In a different way. Like normally you'd be on a conference call. Um, normally you wouldn't see everybody in a way that you do now. So I feel like that's the other side of it is a lot of, a lot of folks. And I, I, I can say the same thing is I feel like I developed much more rich relationships with people outside of my market because 
it was all about much more authentic sort of virtual communication than it was before. So all of those pieces, I think, have helped to sort of support our culture. Mm -hmm. Kristen, did you have anything to add? That's a lot of the same stuff that Lindsay and Lisa have said. I think, um, you know, we've done virtual baby showers, right? I mean, just everything to keep the things that we would have normally done to keep doing that, even if it's virtual. Uh, as I mentioned, the majority of us are still at home. So we do still do a lot of Zoom, which I think does keep those people that, you know, maybe are getting out less, at least seeing some of us, whether they want to or not. But um, also, I think like our women's uh, business groups, we've, I think this week we have Glennon Doyle speaking. So we've, we've done a good job of bringing in a lot of, of speakers that everyone can watch virtually. And I think there's just a lot more attention to that stuff now than there had been in the past. So Yeah, that's great. And I, I want to say, Michelle Jones, who asked this question, I think from a leadership standpoint too, and I've heard this anecdotally, from some crew members is that the whole culture and, and I think um, the spirit of culture in a hybrid environment where women are still, I have heard from women that said they have to be vigilant about making sure that they're not forgotten um, when men who may be back in the office are talking about deals or opportunities that come up, things like that. So I think partially, Michelle, I don't know if that's where you were going with that cultural thing as well, um, because I do think that that has been heavily impacted if you're a woman and you're trying to kind of, you, or you already had to be vigilant when you were in the office. So being out of the office really makes you step up that. And then to your point about culture, I think that some of the things that, that um, they all addressed really went to that as well. I'd like to, you know, Amy Tobaya, you asked, was there any discussion in the research of how women were able to get their partners to shoulder 50% of the extra workload at home versus how many were unable to, uh, or didn't have the option and did that, um, situation impact the rest of the responses to the pandemic? The answer is, I don't think so, but I don't know, but I would ask Laura Lewis. Yes, yes, we do have we do have a data point on this and I'll share it with you. 42% uh, managed the majority of the family care. 41% managed it equally with a partner, which I thought was surprising. It was, it was pretty balanced, but yes, we do have data points in the paper um, around that. So thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's really interesting, Laura, that it was 42 and 41%. As an older woman with children who are grown and gone, um, I have observed that I think that, um, and I could be wrong, but just generally speaking, that younger generations of uh, couples who are both working, there te seems to be more of a team approach to parenting versus what we, what I grew up with or what um, my husband, he's, he's fantastic. He was probably more in charge than I was of the kids, but um, but uh, I do think there's more support than perhaps in the past. Um, and I'm not, everybody's different, but. Um, and then Chantal asked any panelists, to any of the panelists, given we are in CRE, how are your organizations embracing flex flexible work? Um, it sounds like everybody is, but is there anything that's different or unique um, or have you already made the decision? I think um, Kristen might, might have said that Capital One has already made the decision to maintain a three, two, and it has that been true for Lisa, you or, and or Lindsay? Ours hasn't been, been totally finalized yet, so we don't have a formal policy at this point. Mm -hmm. ours isn't, Dave, sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. No, I was just gonna say ours isn't totally finalized either, but what I would like to say is even prior to the pandemic, um, we have been big supporters of flexible working. Um, five years ago, I, my husband's job relocated to Austin, Texas, and I sat down with my boss and I said, you know, look, I'm not done here. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I still think I have a lot, lot to do, a lot to change, and I love my job and give me a chance. And he gave me that chance. So five years, I worked remote. Um, you know, I think Michelle said she feels disconnected. I understand that. It took me probably a year to truly feel uh, comfortable working from home and trying to connect with my team virtually, um, but I was able to do it. And if anybody still feels disconnected, all I could say is make sure that they hear you and see you as often as possible. I made sure that they never forgot who I am and mm -hmm. everything I do. So mm -hmm. I, I hope that does help. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thank Many thanks to our panelists. And I wanna wrap up here. Here are things you can do with the research. Please, please, please. Uh, take advantage of this and share it with your company leaders, your HR, um, and your employees, as well as on uh, social media. And I would encourage chapters to present this data in your local market. 
Uh, you can have invite your crew board liaison to come to your market and share this. And I also wanted to just end by saying, look, it's a changed world uh, and employers need to take note uh, or you know, we'll lose any gains that we've had, um, you know, both in diversity. And there's three points that I would make. Um, women will walk out the door for a better culture. And it's different. It's really difficult to find good people. So if you have a set policies and a framework for employment that keep those good people there, you don't want to have to replace them. And third, you know, it, I've often heard, we've all often heard that a culture trumps strategy. And I think what we're learning through this pandemic and what's gonna happen going forward is culture trumps everything. Um, maybe not sad because women still need to be paid equally, but you know, culture does tr trump everything in this it, going forward. And so those are some important points to keep in mind. And thank you for being here. And thanks to our panelists and many thanks to Laura Lewis, who is quietly always doing the bulk of the work that needs to be done. So Laura, thank you for everything you do for crew and your exceptional work. And Laura is the point person. If you need copies of the report, get in hard copy, or if you'd like the link, it's going to be up on our website once we, I don't know if it's, is it there now, Laura? Yeah, I just dropped it in the chat. Perfect. Now you can all have it. Thank you for joining us. And please, please share this data and help us bring this to life in all of your companies. Have a great day.